So maybe you're that person that you get up in the morning and you have to make your bed. Your bed has to be made. That's a good habit. Maybe you're that person that you feed your pets before you eat breakfast. Maybe you are always punctual everywhere you go. You're 10 minutes early. That would be my husband and my oldest daughter. Maybe you um, practice good hygiene. Maybe you brush your teeth three times a day and floss because you like your teeth, right? Maybe you eat a healthy diet. Those are all great habits. But what about those other habits? The one on Monday morning when your alarm goes off and you keep hitting the snooze button over and over and then you're late to work. Not such a good habit. What about the one about biting your fingernails? I don't know, do we have anybody that does that? A few people, okay. What about if you let the dirty dishes go too long? You never put the dishes in the dishwasher after you eat. Then you have this party of dishes on your sink until somebody tackles them. What about this one? You are sharing from the communal salsa bowl and you double dip. That is not cool. That is not a good habit. Okay, and then what about this one? Picking your nose. Okay, that is not a good habit. But you know what? Studies show that this is a stress reliever. So I don't know now, is this a good habit or is it a bad habit? I'll let you decide that. But we are creatures of habit. And Harvard University says 40% of people's daily activities are performed each day in almost the same situations. So what you did yesterday is much the same of what you're going to do today and tomorrow. We are creatures of habit. So my habits are, I wake up in the morning, I go out and I exercise, get that fresh air, get the body moving. I come home, I eat breakfast, one egg, one piece of toast with honey, and one cup of tea with milk and candy ginger. And while I eat, I do my online Bible devotional. That is my routine, and it gives me the momentum for the day that I need. Now, when I don't exercise, I can make it through the morning. It's okay. But if I don't eat, it is a problem. And I know my morning won't go as well until I eat. So let's watch this video to give us some hint about where we are going with habits. Good habits build good health, good habits build momentum, and good habits draw you closer to Jesus. If you knew that you could have big results from beginning a good habit today, would you start one? How about it? Okay, great. Well, let's see what the Word of God has to say about this, but we'll be turning to John 15. But first, I want you to think about those people that you admire with good habits. They have lots of energy. Maybe they're healthy. Um, they exceed expectations. They're problem solvers. They get things done. They have visions. So we're always going to them because they have great ideas. They're happy people. And if they're rooted in Jesus, then they're talking to other people about him. And maybe that intimidates us just a little bit because we're out of our comfort zone in that. But, you know, they didn't get there overnight. It's been a progression of practicing these smaller decisions every day that led them to the routine of habits that brought them success and made them rooted in the Word of God. Because our rooted friends didn't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a Holy Spirit, supercharged, radical follower of Jesus Christ, bringing 10 people to Christ this week. No, that's not how it happens. We are not born rooted. We have to pray. We have to be in the Word and it takes some sacrifice. And see, people don't see the sacrifice that it takes to get there, but we see the results, right? But fortunately, there is much grace. There are much grace in the habits and encouragement from our Lord and encouragement from each other. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy Father, we invite you into our space in the power of your spirit, God. Would you come and show us how we can draw closer to you. God, we thank you for your grace that you bring us 
each and every day as you pour into our lives, as you reshape our hearts so we can become more healthy. Point out, God, a habit today that we can press into, not so we can check it off, but so that we can press into the power of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, a healthy life is rooted in Jesus. The health we're talking about is not a six-pack. It's not a certain amount of weight that we have our goal to reach. It's not running a five-minute mile. It is holistic health. Holistic health. Mind, body, and soul. And so as we talk about these habits, you actually have a handout in front of you, and it has our seven spiritual habits on there that affect our health that bring us to the Lord, into his presence. Because the habits are about about a rhythm of life that we practice so that we can be in his presence and so that our emotions can remain stable. So we have something to say to other people that's not just advice and a pat on the back. So we have the power of Jesus in our life. It is a partnership. And that's what we mean when we talk about the rooted life. It is a partnership with our Father God, with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Let's turn to John 15, 1 through 11. And this is the passage of Jesus, the true vine. And this is a teaching he gave them soon after he had washed their feet. Now, how many of you have read this passage before? Okay, several of you. All right, we're going to talk about it in just a minute. Let's read it. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. So Jesus is the vine. God is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't bear fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You've already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you, So remain in me, and I will remain in you. So there's a natural pruning process that happens as we are in the Word, as we're reading the Word every day. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Do you believe that? We have to be in Jesus to be fruitful. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what, church? Nothing. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. I have to sit there with that and think about it. I can do nothing of benefit or good without my Jesus. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and it withers. Now let's go to verse 8. When you produce much fruit, you are my disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And I did skip that one line in verse 7. You may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Because he plants his desires in our heart as we remain in him. So we know what to pray. So a healthy life is rooted in Jesus. Well, I think about these words remain. Remain means to stay. Remain means to abide, King James Version. And sometimes they just glide over me and they do not make an impact. And that's why it's important for us to sit in the word and ask God, What is it you want me to see here? Part of this reflection. Because if we just read the word on our own people, we're going to get a little bit, but we are not going to get the impact of what the Holy Spirit wants to teach us. We want to rely on him to tell us what we need to know. Because he will tell us what we need for the day, what we need for tomorrow, and maybe even next week. We cannot limit our God and how he communicates with us. So when I looked in the message version, not a translation, but a version in verse 4, it said, live in me instead of remain. Live in me, make yourself at home in me, just as I do in you. Now, when I heard that word, 
make yourself at home in me. It brought a whole new picture to my mind. Envision your idea of an ideal home. You're coming home from work after a long day. You're a little tired. You know someone's at home expecting you. You walk in the door. Your family comes to give you a hug. Your puppy comes and licks your feet. They're so happy for you to be there. And you smell your favorite food. And on the table is dinner. And you all sit down together. You converse. You have conversation. You talk about the winds of the day. You talk about maybe some unexpected things that didn't go well. And your family says, that's okay. Tomorrow will be a better day. Then you clean up the dishes, you wash them, you put them away. You go into the living room and you get comfortable and you settle in. That's how it can be when we open the word of God and we make our home in him. He wants to hear about our day. He invites us to himself to live. He wants to build us up. He wants to pour truth into us so we have stable emotions and good health. He wants to empower us to use our gifts for him. One of those habits on the back of the card. Living in him. Make yourself at home in him. Have fun. Have fun. Jesus was fun, wasn't he? He had to laugh with those disciples, right? You have to laugh. Living, having fun together, studying the word together is fun. It's part of being together. We are better together. And of course, the point of this that we read at the end of this um, in verse 11 was so that you can be filled with joy. I'm telling you these things so that you can be filled with joy overflowing, not just a wee bit, but a lot, a lot of joy. Well, I don't think anybody can argue that Jesus had the best habits. He didn't come home after a three-day conference of teaching people on a big hill and say, God, I don't have time to pray. You don't understand. Not only did I have to teach these people, I had to feed them and I had to tell the disciples how to do it. Always busy training them. And you know what? Peter, oh my goodness, he's always talking. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. He spent time with his father and he discipled others. He was a mentor. He served the community. He cared for the hurting, the marginalized, and the poor. He gave people back their dignity. He loved people. And so he had an impact on his region that had the domino effect that continues to reach the world. Jesus practiced good habits that had momentum, that built health, and pointed people to the Father. Rooted habits are not a checklist, but they are a rhythm of life because we are partnering with our Jesus. So, again, not a checklist. A checklist has no power. It has no grace. It's all about me and it's all about you. But when we invite the Holy God into these habits, there is power. There is power. So the first habit is, you can see on the, well, actually, it's, let's go to the next slide, please. We use the acronym to make it easy. So the acronym isn't on here of growing, but we have it up here on the screen. So God's word, being in God's word, making our home there. You know, this whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation, is God communicating with his people. God and Jesus, Holy Spirit, talking to his people and his people talking to him. And so as we open up the word, we are writing our story with God. We're into that rhythm. He's telling us what we need to know. He's reassuring us, building confidence in us. When we know who we are in Jesus Christ, we have confidence. We know who we are and we know what to do. But let's make it fun. I mean, sticky notes and highlight pens and colored pens are not just for kids, right? I don't know. How many people use those? I use them all the time. 
get your Bible, one that's fun to read. We use the New Living Translation. And mark it up. I mean, this Bible is still sacred, even more so with your notes. Just think about that as a legacy that you could give your children, that you could give your grandchildren of the promises that you prayed that God answered, that maybe they are continuing to see in their life. That is powerful. Jesus will meet us in the word. Proverbs 4.20, my child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully. God says, don't lose sight of my words. Let them go deep into your heart, for they bring life to those who find them. And healing. Can you say healing? Healing to the whole body. Healing to the whole body. You know, life can knock the wind out of our lungs. I just keep thinking about the time I was in first grade. First time I went across the monkey bars. Just going, 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 going. All of a sudden, bam. Fell flat on my face. I wasn't embarrassed because I couldn't breathe. <laughs> Have you had life happen to you like that? Or it just deflates you? You have nothing left. We need the words of our almighty God. The one who spoke the world into existence can speak life into you. That's why it's so important that we are living in the word of God. Isaiah 50 verse 4 says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples, wise words, that I may know how to sustain the weary with the word. He awakens me morning by morning to listen as a disciple. The power of the living word to sustain somebody who's weary, that somebody could be you. Be in the word. Find that promise that Jesus wants you to cling to because Jesus' name is all-powerful. And be that person, like Scott said last week, that you are building someone's world. You are speaking life into their world. You are speaking gifts into them that they already have, but perhaps they do not see it. And you're encouraging them day by day. You're, you're cheering them on. That is the power of the word in our heart when we're living in his word. And that brings healing. Then we have the habit of prayer that goes with scripture, that goes with our life. I don't know how people can go through the day without prayer. I, I suppose if I think back far enough, I can, I can remember that. It was all about me and what I was going to do. But prayer, we make it into such a big thing. We make it into a checklist. I would encourage us not to do that. A prayer can be silence. I'm waiting on my God. I'm sitting in silence. And he speaks. He speaks through worship. He speaks through other people. But he also speaks into the silence, which can be very powerful. He also answers our prayers, as we just read in John 15 when we're praying as well. Um, four years after we moved here, Bryn had injured discs in his neck. He was in a lot of pain, and he needed surgery. They were very jagged edges that were pressing into his spinal cord. And so we prayed for him, and the staff prayed for him. He went back for his x-ray a few weeks later. Oh, these discs are fine. You don't need surgery. God healed him through the power of prayer. We prayed for this church to happen, to be a church plant. We prayed for a pastor to come and be our lead pastor. And at first it wasn't on his radar because he was so successful where he was. But eventually the power of prayer won over. <laughs> and we have been so blessed. So blessed. We started out at Modesto Covenant meeting in their multi-purpose room. Then we went to Enox for five years. That was a grand time. How many people were there at Enox? A few. You remember it. We had such a great time, such great worship. It was loud, right? It was loud, very loud worship. We had a lot of students there that came to worship. And then we went to Orchard Elementary, and we were praying. We were praying for office space and for a building. Boom. 
What did God do? This property became available. Actually saved for us. 11 acres. We paid for it and God raised the money. He helped us raise the money. Because this was part of our future. God has our today and he has our future. But you know what? It's not going to be delivered by Amazon on our doorstep. We have to get into the word. We have to pray. We have to do a little bit of hard work. But the blessing and the reward, we cannot even imagine it. We know that our God is still working in building hope because of what he's done. So our hope is alive and it's growing because we know that Jesus will do it again. Praying in the name of Jesus is powerful. I have to bring our attention to John 16, 24. Jesus says to his disciples, Until now, my friends, you have not asked the Father for anything in my name. But now ask and keep on asking and you will receive so that your joy may be full and complete. Now this makes sense because Jesus was with them. So maybe why would they say in Jesus' name? But he's telling them now to be prepared for when he ascends. Jesus' name is all-powerful. He is God the Father, Jesus the Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus is also the great I Am, just like our Father God. And in Jesus, healing occurs. In Jesus, salvation comes to us. In Jesus, we are baptized in his name. We are justified in his name. Everything you do and say is in the name of the Lord Jesus. Colossians 3.17. That's what he wants for us. His name is all powerful. All powerful. And 2 Peter 1.3 says his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. And part of that is recognizing the power that is your inheritance. And Paul talks about that in Ephesians 1. That you can ask for wisdom. That you can ask for revelation. And you can expect it. Expect it. Write it down. Keep praying for it. Write it in the margin of your Bible when God answers it. When he gives you that wisdom. Relationships. The R. Connecting in life groups. We are signing up today. You can sign up for the fall season. So... I can't say enough about life groups, but I'll try to keep it brief. We have so much fun together. We dig into the word together. We pray for one another. We all have different ideas about what the word means sometimes because we've all had different experiences. And so when we walk away from that, you are enriched. It's like you've been in a, a, well, it is a Bible study, but it's so, we have so much fun. I don't even know if I can call it a Bible study. Sometimes we have to stop um, and we just pray. And we sit in prayer because there is a great need. And we recognize that Jesus is the healer. And Jesus is the one that answers to our, our cry. And so we will lay hands on somebody and we will just pray. And you walk away from that and you are Holy Spirit charged and you know who is in control. It's not us. It's Jesus. And we see the answer to those prayers. He is healer. He is the way maker. Paving the way. Don't ever come or not come and say, I'm so tired. I don't know if I can make it. I mean, I've done that before. So I recognize that. I confess that. But once you get there, I promise you, you will be renewed. Because you've been in the word. You've been in with your brothers and sisters. You've been in prayer. And the spirit is present. Another thing we have is the spiritual check-ins, which is something a little new. We've been doing them for the past year. It enables us to pray for one another, to see those prayer requests. We encourage everybody to take part in that. Life groups, life group leaders, all the team leaders. And I think one of the best things about that, besides knowing how to pray for people during the week, is that I read about the evangelism stories. I mean, some of the life group leaders and people in my life group, they are crushing evangelism. They are inspiring me. They are talking to their neighbors. Some of their neighbors do not speak the same language. And so they are using Google Translate to communicate. I mean, is that Jesus or what? 
That is Jesus going before them to make those contacts, to share kindness, to share gentleness, to share the power of who Jesus is. We also have mentoring in our relationships. Mentoring is very important. Churches are recognizing the power and the need for mentoring, that we need that in the body of Christ. So Brent and I experienced that before we got married. We had this wonderful couple, Jeff and Joyce, that mentored us. Um, they were in Norman. He was I had a very busy job. He was a professor at OU, the head of chemical engineering. His wife was expecting their fourth child. I don't know how she did it, but she had a freshly baked dessert every week, and we studied the Bible together. That was so valuable and helpful to me because I was struggling with some things. I was struggling with some things I had been brought up with, and then the direction of our faith in our marriage. We both love Jesus, but I had a lot of questions that I needed answered. And so that time with mentors, with people who had been there and walked that road, it paved the way for a successful marriage for Brent and I. And I greatly um, value and I'm so thankful to them that they took time out of their week to share with us. Now we get to the offering, offering. So where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And you know what? God knows that. And Paul, I don't know that he had a problem with offering, but in Romans 7, he said, I do not understand what I do. I find myself doing what I do not want to do. Well, if you receive your paycheck on Friday, you might find yourself doing what you don't want to do if you're overspending at Costco or Target, right? It just slips out of our bank account so easily with that debit card. Well, we have the life group for you. Jennifer Hodges is starting Realign, which is a, a group for aligning your finances with God. So you might be interested in that. Um, also, we have 13 other life groups that you can sign up for today. But Realign will be very powerful and great if you want God to help you with your finances. So when we moved west, we moved to Arizona first and then here, every time our house took too long to sell, sometimes a year. And we've had this happen multiple times. So we had to tighten the budget strings a little bit. We had to watch the bank account. We didn't have as much, but you know what? I never felt it. But we had to trust. We had to trust, but we didn't stop giving. And God blessed that. But it was a stretch of faith because we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know if our house was going to sell. But God sold it in his perfect timing. Three different houses. So God is teaching me to have faith and not to hold on too tightly. Not to hold on. Be generous because he has been so generous with us. He provides each and every day. And now we're on to W, worship. Worship and the Sabbath. So we just had incredible worship together. That blesses not only us, it gets our, our minds on God, but it blesses our Father to hear us sing to him. Our God has emotions. He was a creator of emotions. It brings him so much joy to be thankful. Think of how if you're a parent, and your kids never say thank you. That kind of hurts, right? Our Father loves it when we exalt his name and lift his name on high. Let us consider how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as we see the day approaching. Hebrews 10.25 We can encourage each other when we come together. And as we sing, what are we singing about? We're really singing about the restorative work of Jesus, of what he's done in our lives and celebrating that victory. And you know what? It's very hard to be um, frustrated with your kids or with your spouse when you're clapping and when you're dancing and when you're singing, right? Jesus enters into that. He changes our mindset and we leave here transformed because of his power. Now, when I was growing up, it was never a question, are we going to church, are we going to church? No, we knew we were always going to church, Sunday morning and Sunday night. And so that habit 
is so valuable for our families and for our kids. Even when we were camping, we knew where we were having church. It was around the campfire. There were seven kids and four adults, because we always went with our cousins, and we'd have the scripture, we would have singing, and we even had communion. And those times are so precious to me. Have church with your family, even when you're out of town. I know Megan has made a book for the kids, a devotional book, right? Yes, you can use that with your children this evening to have a special time with your family in the Word of God. And then we have impact, serving outside the church. We have so many incredible places to serve at. Gospel Mission, Modesto Pregnancy Center, Wellspring Charitable Gardens. A lot of our groups spend time at these different places. I like what Matthew 5, 7 says, In the message, you are blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, full of care, you find yourselves being cared for. Isn't that how it is? When you're serving others, when you're helping them, you yourself receive the blessing back in full measure, beyond our expectation. And then we have new life, inviting others inviting others to know about Jesus, talking to them about the new life that they can have, that they can be a new creation, that his mercies are new every morning. And so, again, my friends, um, life group leaders and people in my life group, they've got me on the Google Translate because I have a neighbor that I meet um, frequently in my neighborhood, and she's probably about 75, and we do not speak the same language. But yet we still communicate with each other using a lot of hand motions. So now I know I can be using my Google Translator, and maybe we can actually share some answers to our questions and know what each other said. I'm looking forward to that. But you know what? If I didn't pray about that first, I would miss the opportunity. You know, when you have that nudge, in your mind, and you're like, I don't know if I should do that. I don't know if I should walk over to that person or not. If the Holy Spirit has given you that nudge, go for it. Seize the opportunity because God will work in it. God will work in it. And then we have the spiritual habit of gifts, serving inside the church. We have so many incredible teams in our church that you can be a part of. I would urge you to ask the team leaders of pastors about serving because we have so much fun together. We are great friends, and we pray for each other, and life is better together. So good habits, good habits, the ones on those cards. It's about having a rhythm of life that draws us into God's presence. Good habits build good health. Good habits build momentum. Good habits draw us closer to Jesus, and then that brings transformation. Andrew Murray, a well-known pastor back from the 1800s and even lived into the 1900s, says, acts produce habits. Habits predisposition, dispositions form the will, and the rightly formed will is character. This is transformation. Habits matter. Now, I have a word of caution. This is a dangerous part of habits. When we start a habit, we may not see progress soon enough, and then we think, oh, I don't really need to do this. It's the same thing with opening up the Word of God. I open up the Word of God. I'm having a great time with my Savior. I'm reading it every day. I've got a rhythm going. And then, you know, school starts. Um, you're, You're going to work every day. You have meetings to go to. Life gets busy. And so this is the first thing that will go out of my schedule. And I think back and I'm, you know, I missed reading a few days. Oh, oh, then I missed a week. I think, oh, it didn't really make a difference. I did okay. I made it throughout the week. And then, maybe with that time that I was reading in the evening, I start watching more news. Or I start watching Netflix because I want entertainment with adult content, and I'm, you know, I'm watching more movies every week, and I'm thinking, oh, I can watch these. It doesn't affect my mind. It doesn't affect my heart. And so now I've leaned into a whole new belief system. Good habits don't really help me, and bad habits don't really hurt me. Oh, 
Guess whose strategy that is? The enemy's strategy. So we have to be persistent. One decision at a time, practiced routinely, practiced consistently, will draw us continually into the presence of God until we just find ourselves living there. It's so easy to talk to him. How many talkers do we have in the crowd? How many extroverts? How many people like to talk? Okay, this is for you. You can talk all the time, and God loves it. He loves it. He loves the way he made you. You are special and extraordinary. If you're that silent person, he loves that too. Just come before him. Let the Holy Spirit work. Let him intercede. So don't give up because remember the video of the domino effect. If you take three dominoes out, you're going to have a gap. And those gaps in our spiritual habits will leave us with emotions that are swirling. Emotions that are unhealthy which then affect our behavior and our relationships. When we're planted in the word and living in Jesus and he's living in us, we have peace. We have joy. It's not from us. It is supernatural. Can I use that word here? It's supernatural. Our God is supernatural. He does the impossible. So when you consistently practice these habits, the results will happen. We are rooted and radical people. We don't need to apologize for that because our Jesus was rooted and he was a radical follower of God, was he not? He was. So in an unusual year, adding good habits is wise. We've been through an unusual year, right? Good habits are effective, they're efficient, They help us focus, they build good health, they build momentum. Well, I think in the past one and a half years, we would say these rooted habits have been our lifeline. They've kept us anchored in hope. They've kept us rooted in the presence of Jesus when our world was spinning out of control. But my challenges began before the pandemic. So about two and a half years ago, My kids were here for Christmas, my grandkids were here, and they had been here for a week, and then I got a phone call that my mom had fallen, she was going to need hip surgery, this was the second time, and so I flew the day after Christmas back to Oklahoma City, to Edmond, to take care of her. And I was so thankful that I could do that. Well, her care was progressing very slowly, so I needed to stay a third week. And at the end of that third week, I went to Mardell's, which is the most magnificent Bible bookstore. They have all kinds of great things. And I was in the book section, and I found this book on healing. And I opened it up and started reading it. And the first paragraph I read, I just had the Holy Spirit shivers from my head to my toes. And I kept reading. I was like, I have to get this book. It was a book of devotionals. It was a book of prayer. It was a book of scripture. I thought, I need this. I need to get this. So I take it home. I was up until 2 in the morning reading this book. It was so good. I couldn't put it down. It was the power of the Holy Spirit, of God's Spirit talking to me, preparing me, just as Jesus had prepared his disciples. We see 12 hours later, my mom died in her wheelchair, sitting in her bedroom, right after I helped her get up from a nap. It was unexpected. I had no idea my time with her was so limited. But God was preparing me. See, the healing book wasn't for her. It was for me. My emotions were already swirling. But God had anchored me in the truth to know it was okay. That she was in peace. That she was in joy. That she was no longer suffering. Because she was in the glory of God. But I needed that anchor. I needed to know. I can tell you that the past few years have not been the best in my life. 
But what has anchored me is my life group, serving on worship teams, being in the word, worship, prayer, serving. All those things have built hope into me, those spiritual habits that draw me into the presence of God. Jesus says, I've told you these things so that you can be filled with my joy. It doesn't really matter at the end of our life if our kids didn't make all A's and B's. It doesn't matter if we drove an older car and never a luxury vehicle. It doesn't matter that you didn't get that promotion. It doesn't matter that you weren't part of the popular crowd at school or at work. What matters is who we're becoming, that we're becoming more like Christ, drawing closer to him. What matters is that you were a bold witness for God at your school because you were a youth group every day. You were in the word every day. What matters is you were a true man of God because you practice godly habits. What matters is you're a godly mom encouraging your kids and cheering them on. What matters is that you are financially free and you can give generously to build God's kingdom. What matters is you are clean and sober because Jesus is your rock. What matters is you don't live for the approval of other people because you live for the approval of your Lord God. What matters is because you consistently practice godly habits that you are out there, that you are telling people about the goodness of God because our Jesus name is all powerful and he is so good. Good habits build good health. Good habits build momentum. Good habits draw us into the presence of God. Let's make a decision today to partner with Jesus with these habits. To live in the rhythm of his grace. Encouraging one another. Pressing on. Which habit can you add today to build good health? To build momentum in your life? And to draw you closer to Jesus? Let's pray. Holy God, thank you for your word of life. Thank you that you spoke the world into life and that same power, that resurrection power, that creative power dwells in us when we surrender God to you at the cross. Thank you for the cross so that we have the privilege of your grace of living in it and in these rhythms of life that we call habits. God, would you come and power us through your spirit? Tell us right now which habit we can add today. In Jesus' name, amen.